All right, is that cool? Okay, so we left off on lesson two, the burdens of bondage, just talking a bit about the slave experience. Obviously, there's there is no dignity in this institution. Slaves, there were laws enforced that required slaves to remain illiterate so they could not gain an education. Obviously, those who did gain an education were self-taught or in the case of Frederick Douglass, he was taught to read by his, his um, house mistress, um, the woman that ran the plantation that he was on as a child in Maryland. There was no opportunity for the American dream, very little opportunity to, for a slave or a free African American to pull themselves up by the bootstraps, as we mentioned before. And in many places, the, the literacy laws were very strict, um, and it, there could be, people could be charged with teaching slaves how to read and write, especially after some of the significant slave rebellions. Obviously, slaves found ways to lash back, um, and a lot of that related to like smuggling food, sabotaging equipment um, on the farm. Um, slave rebellions were our oldest slave rebellion that we can trace back would be in Spanish Caribbean in 1522. There's slave rebellions that occur throughout the colonial period. The Stono Rebellion is a famous one in South Carolina near Charleston. Um, in the post sort of new nation era, you see small rebellions throughout, but most rebellions were put down before they ever got started because incentives were put in place on plantations or in communities that if slaves turned a rebellious or a rebellious slave or help shut down a rebellion, they might be able to improve their social status, gain their freedom, um, or receive a cash reward. So we're going to talk about two particular slave rebellions that were had could have had very large implications, but they were stopped in part by um, informants. Yeah, question. Are you that, or was it still like, no, you should not? No, no honestly, it was it was really a lo local and case-by-case -case basis. Um, a lot of communities taught or allowed their slaves to learn how to read and write so they could preach, and there were full um, congregations in, this, in the South, um, but Nat Turner's Rebellion changed that. Um, the, the ability for a slave preacher to have a full slave congregation ended there, and I'll explain that momentarily. But yeah, that was common. I mean, and was that still take work? Were there cases in which African Americans were still learning how to read and write, and a blind eye was being turned even after Nat Turner's rebellion? Yes, um, but Nat Turner sent up sent some serious shockwaves to, to the American South. Um, so some of these rebellions, the oldest, and I think we had Kylie had researched uh, Gabriel Prosser. Prosser's rebellion was in Henrico County, right right outside of the city. The goal or the motivation of his rebellion was to take up arms and lead an attack on the capital, um, the state capital. At the time, the governor was James Monroe. This was before he was president. But there are two factors that squashed this rebellion. One was weather. Um, there were heavy rains um, leading up to this rebellion. And the other was an informant within the, um, the plantation. So his rebellion was squashed. A lot of people were rounded up. He went on the run. He was later captured. And 
he and a significant number of his followers were um, executed for this attempted rebellion. You you researched Prosser, right? Yeah. That's what I thought. Okay. Um, so another significant one, and this is going back to what Michelle was brought up, is Denmark uh, Denmark Vesey. His name's pronounced differently in historians. Vesey, VC. Um, yeah, it, so I, I just go Denmark Vesey. Um, he gets his name from a uh, ship captain that purchased him. He was born in the Caribbean, uh, worked on a ship for a long period of time, and then will become free in Charleston. And when he becomes free, he does odd jobs. He works on ships. He does some carpentry work. But he becomes very pious, learns how to read and write, um, starts to get his own sort of church following. And he establishes the AME Church in Charleston, which we the we'll talk more about the importance of the AME Church in these congregations a bit later, and the African Baptist Church as well. He decides to take his congregation and lead a bloody rebellion in Charleston, burning the town to the ground. But again an informant comes to the goes to the authorities and this rebellion is squashed. This is very controversial because some historians believe that this rebellion was never even planned. It's just that he had too much influence in a too large of a congregation and the easiest way to squash it was to claim that a rebellion would happen um, and to to uh, uh, have these very quick trials and executions. So, same deal for Denmark Vesey. A great deal of his followers were executed as well. By far the largest and most successful slave rebellion, still very controversial to this day, was in Southampton County, Virginia, led by Matt Turner. Matt Turner learned how to read and write similar to Vesey, had his own congregation, but this was a congregation in the rural area of Southampton County. Has anybody out there been to Southampton County or been through it? Anybody been to Franklin, Virginia? Not Franklin County, but Franklin, Virginia. Okay, Franklin County's out in the mountains. Franklin is, is down in the cotton fields and peanut fields of, so basically if you're driving south, like on 95, like you're gonna go to, um, North Carolina. Southampton County is one of those big counties that borders North Carolina. So it's an agricultural county, a lot of plantations down there. Um, and what happens is he has a vision, he has a um, religious vision, and this leads him to getting a group of followers, explaining this vision. He starts preaching a lot out of the book of Exodus, and believes that the only way, it's kind of similar to the rhetoric of John Brown, uh, John Brown comes later, in fact, was John Brown inspired by Matt Turner, I'm sure he was, that the only way that slavery was going to end was by bloodshed. So in August of 1831, he and his followers are going to go through what is present day Cortland, Virginia, and Southampton County, Virginia, and he'll go, they'll go through and they're going to kill somewhere between 50 and 60 people, men, women, and children. All right? He goes on the run. Him and nearly all of his followers, and even people that were not his followers, are going to be executed. And there is a very hotly debated issue in the Virginia, well, not only in the city, but also city of Richmond, but also state of Virginia, as to whether a monument or some sort of plaque or statue or something should commemorate that rebellion. Some people are like, it was the most brazen rebellion against slavery in the American South and the most largest or the largest and most successful slave rebellion um, in America. But a lot of men, women, and children died as a result of it. So it'll be interesting to see how that shakes out. 
we, we're going to keep a pulse on that um, as we move forward. Um, so to go off of the question that Michelle asked, those laws are going to tighten. The Fugitive Slave Act doesn't exist yet. Mason, you talked about the Compromise of 1850. That doesn't that doesn't exist yet, but the localities and the states are going to pull, pull together their own Fugitive Slave Acts. Those, thing, those laws are going to tighten. There's going to be more bounty hunters. There's going to be more home guard going around trying to round up runaway slaves. We really see the slave codes truly tighten as a result of the Fugitive Slave Act passed in 1850. And we also talked about there becomes, as the slave, Fugitive Slave Acts are going to intensify, we see some creative ways in which people are going to escape, like Henry Box Brown, who we talked about mailing himself from Richmond to Philadelphia. Frederick Douglass, does anybody remember how Frederick Douglass got his freedom? He was not. He was actually the child of his master. He is a type. He is a type of apprentice. He worked on ships in Baltimore. So by working on ships in Baltimore, he had met a group of people that had gotten him some papers. But he didn't look anything like the description of the papers he had. It's not like he had a photo of the guy. It was just the description. He didn't. He didn't bear that that look, he was caught the first two times he attempted. He gains his freedom on the, on the third trip. Wasn't that when the guy looked at the papers, but then there was like some sort of rockets? Yeah, the chicken. he was distracted. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. So we got Henry the Box Brown up here on the left. This just shows you the density of the slave population in 1860. What that tells you is that in this area here, the Tidewater region, we also have coastal lowlands. We have this area, what's being grown in this area? Cotton, okay? Right? So the cotton being grown in the Black Belt, and then what do we have going on down here? Sugar. Sugar, right? So what what is important to mention here is that from 1820, or no, I'm sorry, 1800 to 1860, the slave population doubles every 20 years in the American South as a result of not transatlantic slave trade, but reproduction, right? Children being born into the channel system. Furthermore, I want to point this out. That right there, that's Southampton County, okay? That was the second largest slave holding county in the country leading up to the Civil War. That's where Nat Turner had his rebellion. Okay, early abolitionism. I was glad that um, Stephen and Mac wrapped up with the with Frederick Douglass and the abolitionist topic. Um, that directly ties in with what we got going on here. So Something that Mac brought up that I want to echo is that you can really find your oldest anti-slavery movement dating all the way back to the end of the Revolution and the Constitutional Era with the Quakers, Philadelphia Anti-Slavery Society, New England's Anti-Slavery Society. It's also important to mention the American Colonization Society. That was the group of people that wanted to move slaves back to Africa, but that's the weird, ironic part about it back to Africa, most of these people had been born in America. They were African by ancestry and descent, but they were American by birth. So sending them to Africa was seen kind of bizarre in the minds of a number of these slaves. There were a lot of people that were willing participants, not only slaves, but also free, um, free blacks in this era as well. But this is slow to take off. Um, there is some support for the movement. It leads to the country known as Liberia and the capital known as Morovia because the, it was backed by James Monroe who will become president here shortly thereafter and Henry Clay. 
um, who was Speaker of the House. All right. The majority, though, are not interested in being transported to a place that they are not familiar with and they didn't have, they, they had a, a cultural connection to, but not a connection to the land. Um, an important organization that I want to mention that I talked about a few minutes ago was the AME, the African Methodist Episcopal Church. That becomes a really important place in the north for free African Americans to preach, teach, and also becomes the location for a great deal of uh, Underground Railroad locations. Remember the Underground Railroad is not a real system of tunnels, it is a network of sometimes um, churches, houses, schools, and other places to allow slaves to gain freedom in the north and in some cases sending them on to Canada. Um, another group, another religious group as well would be the African Baptist Church. And they were all over, um, I think the oldest a and &E church was established in, in uh, chartered established a and &E church was in New Jersey. Theodore Dwight Weld and Charles Grandison Finney became two of the leading um, voices of the early abolitionist movement. Theodore Dwight Weld is going to write the pamphlet American Slavery as it is. It's a collection of essays, but also like um, they put it, he puts in excerpts from Southern papers, like ads, try to track down runaway slaves, articles about runaway slaves, articles about the treatment of slaves, articles about um, like these scientific articles that slaves were, African slaves were, or African American slaves scientifically were, were lesser. Um, and he puts this together in that article. The reason that I want to bring this up is because American slavery as it is inspires a lot of the content in Uncle Tom's Cat. Did you guys know that already? Yes, no, maybe. Um, another group of people I want to talk about too that have a lot of influence not only for abolition but also the suffragist movement are going to be Sarah and Angelina Grimke. The Grimke sisters were born in South Carolina to a very well-connected politically and economic plantation family in South Carolina. They are basically banished from the South and um, disowned by the family for their abolitionist beliefs. And Angelina will go on to marry Theodore Dwight Weld during the movement. The first martyred abolitionist is not John Brown. The first martyred abolitionist is Elijah P. Lovejoy. Do I have any Simpsons fans out there? None? Kind of? Anybody watch Simpsons? Okay, great show. Um, well, the, has anybody ever seen it? Okay, Reverend Lovejoy on The Simpsons is named for this guy. So Elijah P. Lovejoy was from Alton, Illinois, near the Mississippi River. His printing press was destroyed four times. It was. His house was burned down, and as he was leaving his house, he was killed. Yeah. So he becomes the first martyr of the abolitionist cause. His, uh, ab he, he also had an abolitionist newspaper that he was printing called, called the Alton Observer. So here we have Angelina Grimke on the top left, Sarah Grimke in the middle, Charles Grandison Finney on the top right, Theodore Dwight Weld on the bottom left, and Elijah P. Lovejoy on the bottom right. Some of the radical abolition, uh, Wendell Phillips became known as the golden trumpet of the abolitionist cause. He also becomes one of the, the key people involved in the New England Anti-Slavery Society with William Lloyd Garrison. Um, he'll refuse to eat 
cane sugar or wear cotton cloth since it was made by slaves in the South. The most famous African-American militant abolitionist is going to be David Walker. And I know you're like, wait a minute, what about Nat Turner? Nat Turner actually took up arms. Yes, Nat Turner took up arms, but David Walker in his pamphlet, Colored Citizens of the World, prior to Nat Turner's rebellion was writing about a militant into slavery and historians are still grappling with did Nat Turner get a hold of a copy of Colored Citizens of the World or did he get a copy of The Liberator or any of this other abolitionist um, literature during the era? The answer is probably yes. I mean, a lot of abolitionist literature, even though it was banned in the South, was still circulating. Sojourner Truth, a uh, freed African-American woman. Uh, she was freed by a Quaker family. Um, she was a slave actually owned in New York. Um, New York was one of the last northern states to get rid of the institution. Um, she, uh, she was a major leader not only for the abolitionist movement but also for the suffragist movement as well. Her most famous speech um, is Ain't I a Woman? And then the movement is going to be tied to the suffragist movement. We talked about the Seneca Falls Convention and the Declaration of Sentiments because we see the anti-slavery society produce their Declaration of Sentiments and the Seneca Falls Convention providing their Declaration of Sentiments and what that is all about is providing for the freedom of African Americans, providing for the suffrage of women and ultimately voting rights for African Americans and women as well. All right, William Lloyd Garrison. Um, he is going to be the most famous publisher of this particular time and also famous abolitionist publisher, I'm sorry, and editor of The Liberator. He is also going to be um, the head of the New England Anti-Slavery Society. Um, this is going to inspire people like Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass is going to go on to publish The North Star and his narrative of the, of the life of Frederick Douglass. And I got you guys um, just a little, I'm going to let you guys read this on your own, um, front and back, if you need another copy of it. But what I've got here is um, exactly what Michelle talked about earlier. It ties into that. And it's, a, it's an excerpt from his narrative from chapter 10. And it just talks about uh, his experience in trying to learn, to re or trying to teach other people to read and write, teach other slaves and African Americans to read and write, and how angry uh, people got at, the, at, at, at those attempts. So he talks a little bit about that experience when he was a slave before he became free, trying to teach two slaves how to read and write. Um, some of the political movements, kind of going off of Olivia's research on the Republican Party, is we have the Liberty Party. Um, one of the main backers of the Liberty Party is going to be um, Salmon P. Chase. Y'all familiar with him? We're all familiar with Chase Bank, right? Right. So Salmon P. Chase will be will ultimately be Secretary of the Treasury during the Civil War. He also becomes a justice on the Supreme Court. Prior to that, he was involved in Ohio politics. He was also involved in the Ohio anti-slavery movement, and he becomes one of the leaders of the Liberty Party. The Free Soil Party, uh, there's a Mass Massachusetts abolitionist that is um, key in leading this movement. You've probably heard of this guy before. He'll become one of the more famous Republicans. His name, his name is Charles Sumner. Where have we heard about him? Sumner. 
Where the floor? Well, some yeah, Fort Sumter. I thought somebody said on the floor, which I was like, that's impressive. Remember, Sumner got beat by Preston oh, Brooks yeah, okay. on the floor. Yeah. Oh, he was the one who got Yeah, so we'll talk about the Brooks Sumner affair a bit later. And then the Republican Party. The Republican Party basically brings in Liberty Party members, Free Soil Party members, what leftover Whigs. Um, the Federalists are all pretty much dead by this point. And then some of the no nothings and some other splinter movements as well, anti Freemasons, and other I'm not going to keep talking about. But the, the idea is this they kind of come under one umbrella, they don't all completely agree. Um, but they are moving toward abolitionism. And then we've talked a bit in detail about John Brown. We'll cover that again um, as we get closer to the war, and that is going to be the um, one of the most radical abolitionists um, during this era being John Brown. So here we have William Lloyd Garrison and Frederick Douglass. And we've got the liberator on the left. And the, and, the, and the first sort of preamble of the liberator is pretty, I mean, it's pretty fiery rhetoric where, where and, I, and it's in your text where William Lloyd Garrison says, you know, I will not retreat a single inch. I am in earnest. I will be heard. Um, he almost was killed several times um, by mobs in Boston and other places for how outspoken he was about the abolitionist movement. And then this is um, this is the North Star. Frederick Douglass set up shop in Rochester, New York, and will publish the North Star. I think this is a good place to stop for today. So what we're going to do, we'll wrap, uh, we'll wrap things up next time. Does anybody have any questions? All right, cool.